Hey everyone, so don't worry, I'm not going to be turning this channel into tier list city from now on. This is going to probably be the last tier list video for quite a while. However, I've had some video ideas and topics that I wanted to cover where the tier list medium happens to be the best format to explain away my thoughts. You probably saw from the title that today we are going to be ranking the Soulsborne games slash FromSoft games, whatever you want to call them. The easiest thing is just to call them Soulsborne. I know Sekiro is the standout, but whatever, it's Soulsborne for me. We're going to be ranking all the Soulsborne games on the tier list, and I'm going to be explaining what I think of each game, where they each rank, and yeah, give some thoughts behind all of this. I made a video maybe a year, year and a half ago, where I gave you my thoughts on the series, well, the games that were out at that time in a ranking format. But since then, I've thought about the fact that the tier list format is a lot better in ranking the Souls games, rather than just ranking them from like 1 to 7 or whatever. The other thing is, of course, since then, I now have access to the Demon Souls Remastered, and of course, Elden Ring has come out, so we have quite a bit of new stuff to talk about. Now, before we jump in, a couple of things to explain. First of all, this is based on the game's rankings against each other. If I put something into the C tier, it doesn't mean that that game is bad or that game is like mediocre. Not at all. I think all games in the series are very solidly made games. They all have their benefits, they all have their faults. Again, just because something goes into a C or B tier, it doesn't mean that they're bad games. I know people have this like general idea that something in C tier is already wearing towards bad, but no. Think of this ranking as more like, on any given day, which of these games would I most like to play? Uh, that's more like it, more like my personal feelings. And speaking of personal feelings, I'm just going to put it out there. This list is going to be hella biased. I've always had this theory that people always gravitate towards uh, the Souls games they have played first. And I think that's the exact same with me. So yeah, is this ranking objective? Absolutely not. I don't think anyone's rankings of any game series is going to be objective. But as always, I do want to mention, do let me know your thoughts in the comment section. Give me your ranking because I'm really interested to see what people's opinions are. And of course, I welcome any hot takes or ideas about my tier list placements as well. Also, if you do enjoy the content you're seeing, make sure to subscribe to the channel and also hit the bell notification. It really helps with my struggle against the YouTube algorithm. People are always saying that they don't really get notified that my channel is posting, even though I have been posting fairly consistently. Again, it's a constant struggle against the YouTube algorithm. So yeah, if you do like what you're seeing, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, because it really helps out. Also, I have started streaming again. I'm currently doing a ladle challenge run for Dark Souls 2, and I'll probably leave a link to the first VOD at the end of this video. Anyways, let's go ahead and jump right in. I think the easiest way to approach this is chronologically, in the order the games have come out, so we are going to be talking about the original PS3 Demon's Souls. You probably saw from the list that one of the benefits, and the reason I picked this list, is that it includes multiple versions of the games. Because some of them do have very significant differences, and some of them don't, and I think it's worth covering the different versions of games as well. All right, Demon's Souls, the original, is going to be going into the C tier. Now, obviously, Demon's Souls is the granddaddy of the series. Without Demon's Souls, we wouldn't be having any of these other games. So the series does owe a lot of its legacy to the original 2009 granddaddy Demon's Souls. And believe me, Demon's Souls is a fantastic game. I really, really like it. Probably when we get to the remastered, I'm going to be giving you more detailed thoughts on what I like about Demon's Souls. I think with the original version, it's more worth talking about why I put it in the C tier. And the reason is that this version of the game has just not aged very well. And here I'm mainly talking about two aspects. One is the visuals and the other one is the ease of play. Now, obviously, this game is PS3 exclusive, 
and it is only available on the PS3. The game is not available on the PS Store or in any digital format, so you pretty much need to own a copy of a PS3 and a copy of the game. Now, I happen to have both of those things, but I still never bring out Demon's Souls. Well, mainly at this point because I have the remastered, but even before that, because just setting up a whole new console to play one game is a bit of a hassle. Second thing is, I feel like this is one of those games where the late 2000s visuals have not aged very well. This was that weird point in graphical fidelity where these games are not timeless. I mean, if you look at a game like Super Metroid, Super Metroid has a timeless aesthetic. You can go back to it now and it looks fine with that pixelated art style. Demon's Souls isn't quite there. The character models look awful, particle effects are not very punchy, the environment and everything feels like really muddled and blurry. It's just not the best looking game and more like it's not the best aged game. So yeah, Demon's Souls, you can still play it via emulator, but even that has its issues because the PS3 emulator is not the most solid on PC. Demon's Souls has quite a lot of technical issues. So I can only say that this version of the game has not aged very well, especially with the release of the remastered. So what I would say is, if you really want to play Demon's Souls and you have any way to get a PS5 and pick up the remastered, I know it's not the easiest, do so because uh, going through this whole hassle uh, to play the original 2009 version of Demon's Souls is not really worth it. All right, let's move on. Another very important game in the series, Dark Souls 1. Now, hear me out, Dark Souls 1 is going to be currently going into the A tier. You might be like, what the hell, Mr. Sketchhead, are you high? How is Dark Souls, your favorite game that you've always said is your favorite game, not S tier? Listen, there's one reason, as fantastic as this game is, just like Demon's Souls and the Demon's Souls remastered, Dark Souls is a little bit overshadowed by its remastered version with the extra benefit that the remaster of Dark Souls is a lot more accessible than the remaster of Demon's Souls. Now, if the remaster has never happened, this game would be going into the S tier because the graphics, again, are really the only thing that is holding Dark Souls back. Now, as you guys know, I'm hella biased against Dark Souls. It's the first game in the series that I've played. It's the game that has got me hooked and Again, you're always going to be gravitating towards the Souls game you've played first, and Dark Souls for me is no exception. I feel like even to this day, this is still the most replayable Souls game. It just comes down to the world. Dark Souls has such a fantastic interconnected world that even after all these years, no two playthroughs are the same, and no two playthroughs are ever boring. You have so many options at the start, on what to do, you can sequence break really easily, go down to the catacombs, get a super powerful weapon. There is just so many choices and options given to the player on how you want to approach the game. And I think that's really the strength, the biggest strength of Dark Souls. It has the most well interconnected and most memorable world that FromSoft have really, I don't think really managed to ever suppress. The other thing is, Dark Souls, of course, has some of the most memorable bosses in the series, not just in terms of difficulty, but just like the design of them. And I think it's really no wonder that they've really reused and aped a lot of the designs from Dark Souls in subsequent games. I mean, things like a boss like Quelag is iconic. The Ornstein and Smo duo, probably the best duo fight in the series even now. Artorias, one of the best knight enemies. Gwen is iconic. There are so many iconic bosses, environments, and moments in this game. Now, does this game suffer from a few faults? Of course. As I said, I don't think any game in the series is perfect. The main things that bring down Dark Souls, and we're talking about the original here, are A, what I mentioned a little bit earlier, the graphics, although it's a little bit less offensive than Demon's Souls, Things like Lost Isolith with the Sunny D lava look absolutely eye-melting. And that really sort of bleeds through to the other point, which is the fact that the last quarter of the game is pretty weak. Well, I should say last half. The portion after Ornstein and Smo, aside from a few highlights, is way, way weaker than the start of the game. 
And you know, it's pretty much being confirmed that FromSoft did not have time to properly finish the latter half of the game. And I think it really shows. Now, contrary to that, what really saves the last half of this game is the DLC, because Artorius of the Abyss is one of the best pieces of DLC content ever put out by From. It just adds so much to the game and it really helps save and salvage the last half of the game. Yes, as I said, I'm biased towards Dark Souls. Sure, it has its problems, but it will always hold a special place in my heart. All right, next up, next game to cover in the chronological order is the controversial one, Dark Souls 2. Now, you guys know I am quite a big fan of Dark Souls 2. And despite that, me being a huge fan of this game, I can't really play this game any higher than the B tier. Now, again, I like this game a lot, and I think this is probably the most misunderstood and unfairly hated entry in the Soul series. Sure, Dark Souls 2 has faults, it has a lot of clunkiness to it, but people seriously act like this is the worst game ever put out by From, and it's like so, so, so terrible compared to the rest of the series. That is absolutely not the case. I think a lot of people maybe didn't give Dark Souls 2 a second chance, and are now stuck in that mindset that this game is absolutely terrible and it's impossible to convince them. Believe me, that is not the case. I think Dark Souls 2 is still a fantastic game and it has a lot going for it. Now, the reason this game is controversial is in part due to the aesthetics. This game is a lot more high fantasy, I would say. It's a lot brighter, it's a lot more colorful. I swear, comparing this game, Dark Souls 1, to Dark Souls 2, if you go back and forth, it's like watching House of the Dragon versus Amazon's Lord of the Rings. Like, you, you can still see both of them are well made and there is like a design intention behind the world. But still, if you look at the Lord of the Rings series, you're like, man, this kind of looks weird. Even though it looks good, it just looks weird after a more gritty, realistic world. And I think that's the trap that Dark Souls 2 falls into. Now, of course, the other thing that really brings Dark Souls 2 down are some of the combat choices, mainly talking about the adaptability system here. I don't know who at FromSoft thought that the adaptability system was a good idea. Let me tell you, it's not a good idea. As I mentioned earlier, I'm currently streaming a playthrough of Dark Souls 2. It's a challenge run I play as a deprived with low adaptability, and it's an absolute nightmare. It's so stupid. And I think it's a system that's not explained very well, and maybe a lot of people didn't end up leveling adaptability and just ended up struggling so much. I was the same way. For a long time on my first few Dark Souls 2 playthroughs, I just didn't understand what the hell was going on, that I was seeing people dodging through attacks that I just couldn't, couldn't manage. And leading into that, Dark Souls 2 does suffer from a lot of hitbox and hurtbox issues with the enemies. You will be hit by attacks that feel like you shouldn't get hit by, and enemies do track and pivot way too much, although I will say that Dark Souls 2 is highlighted for this issue, but it's not the only entry in the series that does too much tracking. But conversely, Dark Souls 2 really shines in the freedom it gives the player. The world is even bigger than Dark Souls 1, and I would say there are even more choices. The game is very open, and I think Dark Souls 2 does non-linearity fantastically. Hey, do you want to sequence break the game, get a fragrant branch early and go to the shaded woods? Yeah, do it. Do you want to level up, get the cat ring and jump into the well and do that portion first? Yeah, go ahead and do it. This game is so open and there are so many choices. And aside from areas to go to, this game also gives massive freedom in builds and build variety. I still hold to the fact that this game has the best build variety in the entire series. There are so many weapons, there are so many new weapon classes, there are four magic systems, all of them are viable, so this game is extremely replayable. And I think that's the thing that kept Dark Souls 2 alive for me, that the replayability of this game is off the charts. 
Plus, I do have to give another shout out to the DLCs. I think this this game really is complete with the three crowns DLCs. They just add so much and are actually significant story wise. Uh, and they have some of the best bosses in Dark Souls 2 as a whole. So yeah, is this game unfairly hated? I think so. There are a lot of problems here, but still, I hold this game very close to my heart. Alright, moving on, I really have to start thinking about the chronological order these games have come out in because this is where I started getting lost, but I'm fairly confident that Bloodborne was next. Bloodborne is going to be the first game that gets an easy S tier. Bloodborne, for me, is one of the highlights of the series. It's one of the best games FromSoft have ever put out. You guys know, I am very biased towards Bloodborne, just like I'm biased towards Dark Souls 1. Bloodborne, I think, is the perfect middle road in terms of all the ideas FromSoft have ever put out. It has the faster combat system, still has the interconnected world, it has a unique aesthetic, but it keeps a lot of design elements of the original Dark Souls. I think Bloodborne is the whole package. There's so much to praise about this game, with the main thing that I love being the combat system. The combat system is where Bloodborne really shines. I love the regen mechanic, the trick weapons, the fact that you have a gun instead of a shield, the fact that you have to be very aggressive. Once you get into the groove of Bloodborne, which is not that difficult, it's really easy to pick this game up once you get behind the mindset, the combat system shines incredibly well. The other thing is, of course, the world. I think this is one of the few games that have really managed to get the Lovecraftian aesthetic and do it justice. I mean, a lot of games have the Victorian themes, so that's like, okay, yeah, they've done it. But the additional Lovecraftian elements are fantastic, and I think this game really gets crazy towards the end, which is kind of what I love about it. And yeah, this game is just super unique, and it's really the gameplay of it that I find most enjoyable. Again, it just manages to be the perfect bridge and middle point between all of the ideas, and I think... Aside from Sekiro, FromSoft have never done the fast combat as well as they have in Bloodborne. I also got to shout out the Old Hunters DLC with Bloodborne. Man, the horror vibes in uh, the DLC of Bloodborne in Old Hunters is just crazy. And that clinic area to me still absolutely proves that if they wanted, FromSoft could pull off a very challenging and very atmospheric horror game. That would be such a treat because man do I like survival horror games and really that area gives off major vibes on that front. Bloodborne of course also has super memorable bosses, Mikolash, uh, Father Gascoigne, the DLC bosses Maria and the Orphan of Cause. I mean Orphan of Cause I still think is one of the more challenging bosses in the entire series. Yeah, I can't give enough praise to Bloodborne, and yeah, I just love, love replaying this game. Does it have some problems? Of course. I think probably my main criticisms of Bloodborne has to do with the lack of choice in weapons, particularly at the start. There are maybe like five weapons available to you that are easy to get early on, and there are a lot of very cool weapons locked behind late game quests and late game areas. And if you want those weapons, you either have to be patient and do the new game plus playthrough with them, or just start grinding and leveling up uh, a whole new weapon uh, during the late game. And this is a game where upgrade materials are a little bit scarce, so that can be fairly annoying. I just wish there were more weapons available at the start because that would really help make the first chunk of the game before you get to the cool stuff a little bit more varied. All right, I think the next game we have to cover now is Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin. So Scholar, as I'm gonna call it, is going to also be going into the B tier. Now, I do think Scholar does have a slight advantage over Vanilla Dark Souls 2, mainly with the fact that the Crown DLCs are already bundled in, and with the addition of Aldia. I think Aldia adds so much to the Dark Souls 2 lore as a whole, and he's one of the better characters ever put into the Souls series. He has some really cool lines, really cool dialogues, he's well voice acted, and yeah, is he a lackluster final boss? Yeah, he is. 
But I think the fact that he just leads to a different ending, something that Dark Souls 2 was sorely missing, is very, very helpful. Now, the other changes in Dark Souls 2 Scholar are a little bit hit or miss. I do like some of them. I think Hyde's Tower Flame is way improved compared to the vanilla version. I just like the design and the layout a lot more. And that holds true for a lot of the areas. Forest of the Fallen Giants, I think, as well, is a little bit better. Uh, they've used the variety of enemies they have a little bit more in the Scholar version. And there is, I think, more interesting enemy placement overall. There are some areas where it doesn't work too much. Things like the Shaded Woods, where they've decided to remove the lion enemies and just petrify all of them. Enemies which are very unique and were a signature of the area, and they just basically removed them. So again, the overall changes, I would say, are about 50-50 hit or miss when it comes to the environments themselves. Other than that, Scholar the First Sin is basically Dark Souls 2, with a little bit more of an improved visual fidelity, and of course the game runs better. So in some ways it's better, and in some ways the rearranged areas uh, sometimes feel a little bit, again, hit or miss. That's why I'm ranking it in the same category as OG Dark Souls 2. Still, this is a great game. I still love it. All the things I said about Dark Souls 2 holds true. And yeah, I'm currently replaying it. I mean, I've played this game so many times and I always enjoy my playthroughs. All right, next up, I'm really starting to lose track of the chronology here. I think we have Dark Souls 3 next, right? It has to be. Yeah, Dark Souls 3, you know, I've had mixed opinions on over the years. But nowadays, I can confidently say that I'm happy to put Dark Souls 3 into the A category. I've played Dark Souls 3 a few times off screen, and I can say now with confidence that I really, really enjoy this game. I think it's taken some time for me to appreciate the combat system, but now I really, really do. Obviously, Dark Souls 3 is essentially Dark Souls with Bloodborne's quickness sprinkled in. It's the same style as the original Dark Souls, just it's a lot quicker. And I honestly think at this point now, as uh, sort of undecided as I was earlier, that it works. It really works. And it really works because everything is fast. Healing is fast, item use is fast, spells are fast, and it really, I think, comes together. You'll see when I talk about Elden Ring a little bit, I think one of the issues Elden Ring has is that it has the speed of Dark Souls 3, but it has Dark Souls 1 healing speed. And it's a little bit jarring. I mean, sure, this game, Dark Souls 3, does get a little bit Estus chuggy, but that really complements the vibe the game is going for. It's the same with Bloodborne and how quickly you can heal in that game. And, you know, the other thing that Dark Souls 3 gets shit on quite often is how self-referential it is. But, you know, honestly, going back, and maybe it's just nostalgia blindness, I see Dark Souls 3 a lot more like a love letter to the series, and I think in that context, all of the references and throwbacks are not bad. In fact, some of the throwbacks are fantastic, like Anor Londo. The Dark Souls 3 Anor Londo reveal is still one of my favorites. It's done so well. Irithyll as well. I mean, there's a lot to love about this game. It looks very good. The dungeons are starting to move towards what we sort of got with Elden Ring, which is, I think, the pinnacle of FromSoft dungeon design, in that they are a lot more interconnected and there's quite a lot of shortcuts. I think Lothric's castle is a fantastic opening area and it's really complex. And overall, the game keeps the quality of the dungeons high throughout. And again, it's the combat system. The weapon arts are now meaningful and there's a ton of combat variety, and I think that makes Dark Souls 3 a really, really fun game in just, again, how many builds you can play. Now, of course, Dark Souls 3, as with any other game in the series, has some issues. I think the main thing that I don't like about Dark Souls 3 is how linear it is at the start. You basically have a linear path and it forks whether you want to go to the church of the deep cathedral of the deep first or to the swamp and that's it sure the game opens up later on but 
all of your like first few hours in any Dark Souls 3 playthrough are going to be spent doing the exact same thing. It's a lot less open than some of the other games in the series. The other complaint I have is because of that, upgrade materials are locked away pretty like in a segmented fashion. So it's not really possible to sequence break and have like very strong weapons at the start. Uh, or you have to go very out of your way with farming and all that. And speaking of farming, I think FromSoft have really dropped the ball with the Covenant system in that the items needed to level up Covenant if you're playing offline have like insanely low drops, like 0.05% drops or something insane like that. So you pretty much are forced to play PvP and I don't really enjoy Dark Souls 3's PvP. I don't really enjoy PvP in any game outside of Dark Souls 2. So yeah, those are kind of minor annoyances, but other than that, this game is fantastic. Also, shout out to the DLCs. I think we have one okay DLC pack, Ashes of Ariandel, and one fantastic one with the Ring City, which has some clear, fantastic bosses. I mean, the Demon Princes, who I didn't really like early on, I think are now one of the better duo bosses in the series. And of course, Slave Knight Gale is a great conclusion to the series as the sort of big bad final boss. So yeah, Dark Souls 3, the love letter of the series, is good. It's very good. And my appreciation for it has grown over the years. All right, I think it's time to cover Dark Souls Remastered. You probably know where this is going to go. Dark Souls Remastered is going easily into S. Oh yeah, and by the way, I didn't mention this, but the tier lists themselves are not ordered, so... If something is S tier, it's S tier. It's does, it doesn't matter whether Bloodborne or Dark Souls Remastered is at the front. Yeah, Dark Souls Remastered pretty much takes everything I love about the original Dark Souls, which is basically everything outside of a few minor gripes, and enhances it. It's just a straight up upgrade over the original Dark Souls. It runs better, it looks better, visual improvements everywhere. And yeah, because of that, it's just a lot smoother of an experience. I think there's a lot that much I can say about Dark Souls Remastered because I covered all of my points in the Dark Souls portion of the video. All I can say is it's a straight up improvement. And I'm so happy that this is the game that got remastered because it really does deserve it. And Lost Isolith finally doesn't burn your eyes out when you get to it. Yeah, just a straight up improvement. If you want to choose, always go for the remastered because yeah, that's the official sketchhead recommendation. This game is fantastic and it's an easy S tier. All right, let's talk about the final three. Let's cover Sekiro, which is the FromSoft game I'm currently playing on my own uh, when I'm not streaming. And Sekiro is going to be the easiest A tier I've ever given. Now, I don't want to go too into detail with Sekiro, especially the combat system, because I think the highlight of this game is the combat system. And I'm planning to make a full-on breakdown and uh, sort of like essay, video essay as douchey as that is to say, on the Sekiro combat system, because it's really fantastic. It really is what makes this game uh, stand out. But other than the combat system, which you'll have to stay tuned for when I make that video, Sekiro has a lot going for it. Uh, Sekiro proves that FromSoft can actually make a proper story. They can make characters and they can make compelling stories that are not hidden behind convoluted item descriptions. And I think actually the story of Sekiro is great. I really like that it strays a little bit from the standard Souls formula. It still has like the classic tropes of undead, uh, breaking prophecies and all that, but I think it very much manages to be its own unique thing. Plus, of course, the sort of whole cohesiveness of the platforming, the combat and the stealth really comes together. This is the most unique and out there game in the series. So, you know, some people don't even want to rank Sekiro next to these other games because it's so different. But I feel like it still has some of the core mechanics, enough of the core mechanics that it can be compared. And yeah, Sekiro is a fantastic experience and in my opinion, highly, highly underrated because it seriously has some of the best bosses FromSoft have ever put out. 
and probably the most engaging and deep combat system they have ever put out. So yeah, there will be more on Sekiro, but just know that if you've not given this game a chance, do so because it really is going to capture you. And I think that is the true beauty of this game. Once you get good at it, it's just so enjoyable to play. All right, we're coming up to the two most recent games. Let's go ahead and talk about the Demon's Souls Remastered that is probably unsurprisingly also going to go into the A tier. I love the Demon's Souls Remastered. I know I've mentioned before that in my personal view, graphics don't really matter or only partially matter when it comes to games, but man, do I have to say that Demon's Souls looks fan fucking tastic it's incredible how good the demon souls remastered looks even now whenever i turn it on I, I play it i just marvel at it the environments are so well designed there is so much more depth and detail and the lived in nature of the world is really captured <laughs> that is like insane the difference is insane when you go back to the 2009 version Demon's Souls the Remastered, I think it's still one of the best looking PS5 games out there. Now, other than that, I do have to just mention what I love about Demon's Souls. And what I love about Demon's Souls is that it does capture and does have all of the things that have made the latter games so fantastic. And that is the combat system. I love the Demon Souls combat system. It feels closest to Dark Souls 1, so I feel like I'm right at home. There's quite a lot of weapon variety, the spells are interesting, and the environments themselves are what really shine here. I really like all five of the zones you visit in Demon Souls. First of all, because they feel extremely varied. I mean, the fact that it's not an interconnected world does actually work in Demon's Souls' advantage because FromSoft have been allowed to create areas that feel extremely different instead of having to always think about how this is going to interconnect, <coughs> which doesn't always work. <coughs> Dark Souls 2. And yeah, Demon's Souls does benefit from that. And all five of the areas you visit are very unique and have different gameplay mechanics. In Boletaria, you're avoiding the dragons. Stonefang is way more interconnected. In uh, Valley of Defilement, you have to deal with the poison and you have this like mechanic of the upper level and the lower level. All five of the areas feel very unique, both visually and from a gameplay perspective. This also leads to all of the areas having unique enemies, which I think some of the latter entries in the series are sorely missing, having sort of a lot of copy and pasted knight type enemies and all that, Demon's Souls really does feel unique wherever you visit. Plus, of course, the game gives you incredible freedom. You have free reign to tackle whichever these areas you want, and in whichever order. And that, I think, really helps keep playthroughs fresh with, when it comes to Demon's Souls. Now, again, Demon's Souls, like any entry, has its fair share of problems. I think some of the mechanics are very archaic and a, are not explained well, and B, don't really work well. I'm mainly talking about the world tendency and the character tendency. Character tendency especially, I feel like, is a bit of an afterthought. But the world tendency system is, I think, just like really clunky to manipulate. You having to turn into human form and kill yourself over and over again within a game world just to get it into the darker world tendency is just really clunky and really weird. And on the contrary, it's very difficult to get the world up to the white world tendency once you have done that. And of course, aside from the clunky systems, Demon Souls does suffer from having not very challenging bosses. In fact, I would say Demon Souls is easy overall, although the areas are providing at least some challenge. The boss is less so, say aside from Flame Lurker, but even then, if you know what to do against Flame Lurker, he's very easy. And maybe the False King Galant, none of the bosses are actually challenging. Plus, there are a ton of gimmick bosses in Demon Souls that function more like puzzles, and a lot of them don't work, like Leechmonger, and the Dragon God especially, horrible, horrible fight. So yeah, the bosses are clunky, but the standout here really is the areas. And I think, yeah, but you know, don't get me wrong, there are some good bosses here, but a lot of them are like either mediocre or just straight up dookie. 
Still, Demon's Souls, as I mentioned in the 2009 version, the, the whole series owes itself to Demon's Souls, and without Demon's Souls, none of these games would be possible, and aside from that, aside from the legacy, it's still a fantastic game all around, especially the remastered version. And we have reached the final entry, the most recent Souls game, Elden Ring. I can already hear the pitchforks, people are sharpening them. Elden Ring for me is going to be going into the B tier. Okay, before you jump at me, hear me out. Just consider the fact that I love all of these games and I really enjoy both Scholar of the First Sin and Dark Souls 2. Really, really enjoy them. And that's the same with Elden Ring. I really enjoy Elden Ring. I've had immense fun on my, I guess, two and a half playthroughs when you consider that offline playthrough I've did. I've enjoyed a lot of my time. I think the world of Elden Ring is fantastic, if slightly too big. Now, Elden Ring simply cannot be beaten in build and weapon variety. There's so many options. You can do whatever the hell you want. You have so many options available to you and such a huge freedom to tackle this game however you want. I think that's the strength of this game. You guys have probably gathered from this list that I like it when players are given freedom. And no game in the series has done freedom better than Elder Ring. I mean, the open world naturally just gives you that freedom. And yeah, as mentioned before, Elden Ring, I think, has the best legacy dungeons FromSoft have ever created. Uh, Stormvale Castle, the capital, all of these areas are so, so incredible. Even crumbling from Zula, fantastic areas. And if this is the consistency they stick to in whatever game comes after Elden Ring, we are in such a good position because these dungeons are fantastic. Elden Ring also manages to have very memorable and excellent boss fights. Finally, we have a game where the gimmick boss fights are actually working. After all of these games, FromSoft have finally figured out how to do a proper gimmick fight. Like Radon, like Radon, there are so many options. You can tackle him solo and you'll have a challenge, but if you summon, you'll still have interesting gameplay and a challenge as well. It's a gimmick boss that actually works. Same with Rykard, we finally have a good version of the, you know, magical wind weapon, blast the big enemy uh, type boss, which they've been doing since uh, the original Demon Souls. And it really has culminated in Elden Ring in that, again, it's actually a functional and challenging boss fight. But other than that, you have some other highlights like Godric, Morgoth, the Godskin Noble and Godskin Apostle on their own. I've covered this in I this point two 20 minute plus reviews. There is so much I love about Elden Ring and I always have a blast on the first half. Now, the reason I cannot give Elden Ring anything higher than a B, again, if you watch my reviews, you probably know this. I feel like this, this game really drops off after the mountaintop of the giant. There's like such a dip in the gameplay enjoyment that I get from this game. I feel like after the mountaintop, the enemies become really clunky, they deal way too much damage. The difficulty balance is super off, both again in the vanilla enemies and in the bosses. At the same time, it's very easy still to just run past everything. And I just think the second half of Elden Ring, other than a few standouts, has some of the weaker bosses in the series. And I think that's the other issue. I think this game has some of the best bosses in the series, but also some of the most frustrating and clunky ones. And, you know, it just comes down to a balance. I know a lot of people like what Elden Ring is bringing to the table. I still think some of the difficulty balancing is off. Not even mentioning some of the minor gripes I've talked about, which I still hold to account that this is the newest game and the camera is still very, very clunky. And it's pretty much the same camera we've had since this game. So yes, I love playing Elden Ring. I'm gonna be replaying it in the future for sure. But again, when you consider that this list is sort of a ranking of which game I would rather play in any given day, you sort of start to see the logic here and the pattern. And Elden Ring is just a little bit on the back of the list because of the mountaintop 
and also because of the other aspect of this being a huge time commitment. I mean, you gotta commit to an Elden Ring playthrough un unless you want to do a speed run. But still, lot to love about this game and there is going to be for sure more Elden Ring content in the future. And yeah, with that, we have come to the end of this, I think, fairly lengthy video. I have quite a lot to edit out, so we'll see what we end up with. But yeah, this was quite a journey. And this is my ranking. Now, as I said at the beginning, do let me know what you think of this list and how you would rate the series as well on the tier list. I mean, if you want, add new tiers as well. I mean, if you want to put Dark Souls 2 into F tier, yeah, sure, go for it. But I think overall no Souls game really goes below a C tier, especially when compared to each other. All of the entries in the series have their own merit. And again, who knows what will happen? My opinions are constantly shifting. If I made this list a year ago, I would have easily put Dark Souls 3 into B tier. Now it's A tier, so who knows what will happen in a year's time. Maybe Elden Ring is going to be an S. You never know. I keep playing these games and my experience and opinions are always shifting, but currently this is how I feel. Anyways, I'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Thank you very much for watching. Again, please like, comment, subscribe on this video, as well as check out some other content on the channel if you want to. And yeah, I'll catch all of you next time. Peace out and goodbye.